for joining us. Um, a few housekeeping notes. Everyone um, who is attending the webinar is currently muted, but if you are calling in, um, please just double check that your phones are muted so that we don't have any um, outside noise coming in. And if you have any questions throughout um, the webinar, whether it's technical or content related, um, please feel free to chat those to us and use the chat function um, on the bottom right portion of your um, webinar um, toolbar and uh, we will take care of those. We'll have a, a Q&A at the end of the webinar so we'll be sure to keep track of those. Um, the webinar is being recorded and so uh, a link to that will be shared after the webinar concludes and we are also live tweeting today's webinar and conversation so feel free to follow along um, and add your perspective using the hashtag EPPdata. Um, my name is Abby Cohen. I'm a senior associate at the Data Quality Campaign. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with DQC, we are a nonpartisan policy and advocacy organization um, that works with leaders and policymakers across education to help them understand what steps they can take to ensure that data is truly used in service of student learning. And a really important part of that is making sure that everyone involved in education has access to the data and information that they need um, to make the most informed decisions. And that, of course, includes educator preparation programs. So we are really, really pleased to be here for this conversation and want to thank ExxonMobil for their support of this work um, so that we can have a, a really rich and robust conversation about this important topic. Um, so with that, I will introduce our panelists. Um, everyone is logging on with their webcams, so uh, you know, forgive us for a few technical glitches. Um, first, we have Katie Anderson. She is a 2013 South Dakota Teacher of the Year, and she is currently an instructor at the College of Education at Dakota State University. We also have Nicole Della Rocco, who is a, the Data Specialist for Educator Preparation at the Center for Instructional Support at the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Anthony Graham, who is Professor and uh, Dean of the College of Education at the North Carolina A&T State University. Um, and Anthony will be joining us um, over the phone only um, as his webcam isn't working today, but he is certainly here and um, we look forward to uh, a great conversation with all three of our panelists. Um, so before we sort of get into the nitty gritty policy content of this topic, I want to take us up sort of to the to the 50,000 foot level of, of how does this conversation fit into our broader conversations about education um, and improving educational outcomes for kids. And, you know, we're all here because we believe that every kid deserves a great teacher. Um, and we need a, a strong national pipeline of high quality teachers to make that a reality. Uh, our workforce needs really demand K-12 graduates who are prepared for college and career. And states are setting ambitious and exciting goals through their ESSA plans to make that happen. But we're not going to be able to reach those goals without that high quality teacher pipeline. Um, so to do this, we need to have a comprehensive policy conversation about the ways that we can help support, support the continuous improvement of educator preparation programs. Um, and a, a real big part of that is ensuring that the right data is available to inform the policy and practice changes that are needed to improve EPP quality, um, teacher effectiveness, and of course, ultimately, student outcomes. So across education and many sectors, we see challenges around um, effective data sharing, effective data practices. So this is certainly not um, an issue that's unique to educator preparation. Um, but when we do look at this topic and we think about um, what are the challenges that, that we face, um, right now data is not uniformly available. Uh, and in part, that's because states and EPPs and local leaders are operating in silos. Um, and this has created a vacuum of information for leaders at all levels. We have states that collect really um, rich, detailed information about educator preparation programs, teachers in the classroom, um, but it's not uniformly shared back with um, ed prep programs. And when it is shared, it's not always in the most actionable or accessible format. Our EPPs are frustrated often by data collection and reporting requirements um, that don't necessarily help them answer important questions about their own program quality. So very often this can feel like a compliance driven activity that, that doesn't necessarily help them improve their own work. And, and lastly, we have our local leaders, whether it's a K-12 school leader or a district leader, um, who have to make hiring decisions and they have to do human capital planning. And often they are left to sort of piece together data from different sources 
sources to get a, a holistic picture of what educator preparation looks like in their state. Um, and so for so long, I think the conversation around improving educator preparation was really driven by the pending and then the past teacher prep regulations. Um, but as with so many things right now, it's really been kicked back to the state. Um, so it's important to understand what action states can and should take to make this work a priority. Uh, and the last thing I'll, I'll say is that we certainly understand um, and believe that EPP and K-12 leaders are hugely um, important parts of doing this work and play really important roles in doing this. Um, but we do think that state leaders are uh, best positioned to bring together the leaders and the stakeholders who are essential to making this work possible. And because um, states sort of sit at that, at that level, they can um, really help to break down those silos that often block the sharing um, and get everyone around the table and, and figure out what needs to happen to make this uh, work possible and make it a priority. Um, so that's what we're here to talk about today. So with that, I will move into our, our panel Q&A, um, starting with, uh, Anthony, um, in your role as um, a dean, how do you think about continuous improvement and what role does data play in that work? Anthony, are you there? All right, well, while we get, while we get Anthony's audio um, taken care of, um, Nicole, would you, would you mind taking that question? Yeah, absolutely. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, first of all, thank you so much to Data Quality Campaign for having me speak about this topic. It's one that's near and dear to my heart um, as a data specialist in Massachusetts. So I'm really honored to be here um, talking about this topic today. Um, so in terms of how Massachusetts thinks about using data for continuous improvement, I mean, we believe that all educator preparation programs or EPPs should be continuously improving. Um, using data. And we believe that as an SEA, we are uniquely positioned to take some of the burden of data collection, data analysis, and data dissemination off of our EPPs um, by collecting and sharing that data um, in a data platform that we call Edwin Analytics. And the goal of that work being that EPPs are monitoring their own progress towards their goals and, of course, changing course if they need to. Um, just to, to support this work, as I said, we built a data platform to share data. Um, and our data platform is interesting because it really allows EPPs access to a wide swath of data that they can then choose to, um, I call it slicing and dicing the data, um, in ways that's meaningful to them to answer a very specific research question that they have. So for example, our EPPs can look at a given year. So if they want to see how their completers last year um, did on their educator evaluation rating, for example, they can do that. If they want to look at a specific subpopulation of students or in a specific district, they can do that as well. So there are other countless ways to, to kind of um, modify or view that data, um, but all in the spirit of being able to answer specific questions. So like I mentioned, they have access to data points like where are my completers going? Um, what districts are they getting hired in in Massachusetts? How are they doing in those districts? What's their aggregate educator evaluation rating? What about student growth? What were their perceptions of preparation via a survey? So we have all that data um, available and accessible. Um, I should note before I go any further that Massachusetts has had a very long history with this work that I think has positioned us well. And so I just want to summarize very briefly some, some key pieces of work that we've done to get to where we are now. Um, so back in 2010, so about seven years ago, um, we put in place um, specific ID, so unique identi identification numbers for every single teacher in the state. And we did that with the help of the Longitudinal Data Systems Grant as well as Race to the Top. So every teacher, um, once they are officially enrolled into their preparation program, is assigned what we call a MEPID. Um, and that MEPID follows them so we can actually track those teachers um, throughout their progression in their pipeline. Um, two years after that, um, our board passed revised regulations for educator preparation. And it meant many shifts, but most notable for this conversation is the shift um, into a focus on outcome measures in our accountability system, in our state approval process. Um, at that same time, we were having conversations with the state's EPPs about their need to access more outcome-oriented data. 
So we knew that in order to satisfy those regulations, as well as respond to the um, call to action from our EPPs, that we need to think about linking those disparate data sets in order to tell a, a cogent data story. Um, so we're five years in the making into this work, and so now we're in 2017, um, and we're just starting to see the data picture in our state come together. Um, so right now we're engaging in research, we're talking to our stakeholders, we're building out our resources, um, we're doing research. We really want to evaluate um, what these outcome measures tell us, um, while also making sure that it's nested within the context of, of everything that we know. Thank you. I think that history is really important because this work is not something that happens overnight and that there are foundational steps that states can take and should be taking and, and then you build off of those to get to where Massachusetts is today. So I think that's a really helpful perspective to share. Um, Anthony, I think we have you back. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, wonderful. Fantastic. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to, to engage in this conversation. Um, in terms of my work as Dean of an Educator Preparation Program, I think I would speak on behalf of a lot of deans across the nation who would say we're committed to the work of continuous improvement and what that entire process entails. Um, as a dean of an EPP at a minority serving institution, specifically at an HBCU or Historically Black College or University, continuous improvement is very critical to the work we do and it's not simply for accreditation or compliance reasons. Uh, it's much, much deeper than accreditation. Um, HBCUs, we're responsible for producing around 40% of all African American classroom teachers in public schools across the nation. And a large percentage of our alumni will end up working in Title I schools or low performing schools or urban schools with extremely large demographics of students of color or students with learning differences. So it's imperative that minority serving institutions like mine at North Carolina A&T really focus on continuous improvement because our alumni are transitioning to teach in very hard to staff and challenging school contexts. So our candidates must be well prepared in order to engage the students that they'll see on a daily basis. So given that context, obviously we make sure that we use data as part of a deliberate action in terms of selecting candidates who enter our programs and then we collect and analyze data as candidates matriculate throughout our program to assess where students are performing well or where gaps exist in our preparation process. And of course we collect data on our alumni, particularly within the first three years after exiting our program to assess their preparedness for the context for where they're employed. So. Uh, the work that we do is critically important and the students that we're serving in the context where many of our alumni are going, it's very important to ensure that we have prepared them to the highest quality possible. Um, one of those data points that I do want to share and raise today in this conversation is in the state of North Carolina and about 32 other states across the nation, the Praxis Core, for example, is a data point in our teacher admission process. And unfortunately, nationally, the Praxis Core, uh, we're seeing that fewer than 35% uh, of African American students pass the Praxis Core, which means large numbers of African American students are not transitioning into the teacher education preparation programs. So those are the types of data points that we're constantly analyzing and asking the question, what can we do differently? Uh, how do we respond to the gap that exists so that we are recruiting and preparing more students, more teachers, particularly our teachers of color? That's great. Thank you so much. Katie, was there anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, so um, I, I guess I have two perspectives when it comes to this topic. Um, at, currently, I am an in, instructor in an education preparation program, um, and so I certainly have that continuous improvement viewpoint, um, but I also spent 10 years as a middle school science and reading teacher. And um, I guess my thoughts on this are that um, data shows over and over again that the number one indicator of student success in P12 or student achievement in P12 is the teacher that is in the classroom. And so I guess I really feel a sense of urgency to ensure that um, when student or when our teacher candidates enter their classroom for the very first time, they're ready to go on day one. All kids deserve a teacher that is effective and, and impactful. Um, I also feel like 
um, you know, we collect lots of data um, during their preparation program to, to decide if they're prepared or not. But that doesn't always give the whole picture, I guess. And I, I think the best way to illustrate that is to share my experience a little bit. Uh, so on paper, I was a really prepared teacher candidate. I had almost a 4.0 GPA. Um, I had done really well in my student teaching experience. I had done extremely well in my praxis assessments. I, in fact, I even got a certificate saying that I scored within the top 10% of the nation. I looked really well on paper. Um, I student taught in a kindergarten and second grade classroom loved every second of it and was sure once I graduated that I would be hired to teach in a kindergarten or first grade or second grade classroom. I wound up in a middle school classroom in a challenging school in a much, much bigger school district. Um, so I went from a very rural school to in South Dakota, I guess we would be more considered suburban because I don't know that we have any schools classified as urban. Um, but but it was a different and challenging environment and it really threw me for a loop. So was I well prepared? Yes. Was I well prepared for the environment that I ended up in? That's questionable. And I ended up doing fine, obviously, but that first year had a really big learning curve. So I think that as um, educator preparation programs and as schools, we really need to consider um, what can we do to ensure that that our teacher candidates and our program completers are ready to enter into any position that they could potentially land in and are certified to land in. Yeah, that's great. And I think um, across all three of your remarks, you know, one of the, there's two things that stand out to me, right? That um, in order to continuously improve, the big question, right, is, is our programs um, preparing teachers to be successful in the classroom, but you cannot answer that question if you don't know what happens to them once they are in the classroom. And so that that feedback loop is so critical to being able to um, really engage in a in a meaningful and effective process of continuous improvement. And that the data that you need and want and use is really driven by the questions that you have about your particular program, the students that you're training, and that your questions are probably you know there are some questions that that all EPPs are going to want to have the answer to, but there's going to be some variation depending on, on the type of program that you're running. So um, I think that um, your, your perspectives are really valuable to, to highlight that. Um, and as we think about, um, you know, what does it mean to sort of operationalize continuous improvement, continuous improvement, Anthony, I'd love to hear from you about how you, how you do that. What does that look like within your school? Um, and how, how are you really operationalizing this sort of um, theoretical idea of continuous improvement? Certainly, and you, you've touched on a large part of the, the feedback loop, and that's the way we look at it along the continuum, and it's a feedback loop. How are we always revisiting the data, talking about what it means and what the implications are? So what we do at North Carolina A&T is uh, very similar to what you'll see at other EPPs, I believe, in the sense that um, our data collection and analysis processes really move along a continuum that starts with the student recruitment piece. Um, are we identifying the candidates whom we best believe will transition through our program successfully and then enter the classroom downrange and perform at a high level? So the student recruitment, the fit, if you will, and then we transition to the student enrollment, which then moves to the candidate selection process asking ourselves the question, what are the characteristics of a highly effective, engaging classroom teacher, and using those criteria up front to select the candidates that will then enter our EPP program. And then the preparation process, and then moving, of course, to employment and induction. So along this continuum, we're requiring our candidates to produce evidences of learning that illustrate their ability to perform specific tasks relative to things like instructional planning, uh, depth and breadth of content knowledge, um, content pedagogy, cultural competence, the, the ability to differentiate instruction based on the student context, and then of course things like assessment and data literacy skills. One of our program improvement concerns based on what we do in this continuum is always asking the question about the types of evidences that we're asking the candidates to produce. Uh, we're constantly asking the question, you know, is the evidence predictive in nature in terms of teacher effectiveness once employed in a public school? So we're always having to use our data to go back to look at 
the types of evidences that we want the students to produce and then trying to make the connection between okay they can do that here but what will that mean for them three years four years down range and the impact that it's going to have on student learning so when we start talking about the types of data that we truly value then um, particularly once our candidates have graduated and they become alum um, we're really interested in our alumni teacher effectiveness data from our employers um, the classroom observation data from our employers, the, the feedback from our alumni about their perceptions of preparedness to work in the context where they're teaching, um, teacher retention data from the school districts, and then of course our value added data. And I put that one last intentionally because it's important, yes, but it's a piece of the pie is not the entire pie and sometimes I think our states tend to get a little enthralled by and enchanted with value added data and that's the only metric that they see when you have to kind of see the entire picture so uh, it's not that I don't value value added data it's just a part of the, uh, the the picture if you will and some of that is probably a personal philosophy for me uh, if you look at my academic performance as a student if you only looked at my GPA and my SAT score I would not be sitting here having this conversation with you there's a much larger context and other variables that go into who I am so uh, some of that might be driven by my own personal philosophy as well no, but you bring up an important point that, um, you know, I think oftentimes people might sort of glom onto one particular data point and think it tells the whole story, but really there is no sort of all-knowing piece of data and that it's really important that when we talk about anything in education that we're looking at multiple data points um, and trying to paint a holistic picture of, uh, of whatever is going on um, and not making, um, not using one piece of information to sort of tell the whole story. So Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, Nicole? Oh, there we go. <laughs> I was muted, sorry. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about how we as a state agency think about using data um, both for continuous improvement but also for um, accountability and public transparency. So I mentioned our data system that we've developed, Edwin Analytics, and that really feeds into our work around continuous improvement, accountability, and public transparency. And we believe that we are best positioned to improve the quality of educator preparation um, when all three of these efforts exist in a balance, um, and that each is driven by the same data system that we've built to intentionally, intentionally support um, evidence-based decision making. Um, I should note that our accountability system, our state approval process, puts outcome measures at the center of a multi-measured system, um, but it does not take an algorithmic approach, nor does it privilege any one data point over another, to Anthony's point. Um, and this really drives both us as a state, as well as our EPPs, our 71 in the state, to closely examine outcomes data, um, both before, during, and after their state approval process. Um, and it's, it's really this process of this close examination um, that we're going through that fosters a greater understanding of the data um, and probably more important what the what the data is signaling and I use data in the plural there because you know we do believe in a multi-measured approach and we do believe in using multiple measures to sort of triangulate any conclusions that you're drawing from that data. Great, thank you. So just to add to that idea um, a little bit um, and from the, from the teacher perspective and also from the EPP perspective, um, I think it's important to recognize that we are all collecting data um, with the same goal um, that we want to have quality teacher candidates. We want to have quality teachers that enter into the classroom. Um, but I don't know that everywhere that data is being shared. And so I think that it's important to point out that for continuous improvement and to really oper operationalize um, using data for continuous improvement. We need to collaborate closely, and I think that there are some places that are doing a great job of that, and then there's other places that is not, and I think we, we can really learn from each other in terms of how can we, as um, teachers, as um, schools in K-12, how can we as EPPs and how can we as state departments of education work together um, to take that data and use it to ensure we've got great teachers in the classroom. Yeah, absolutely, and I think educator preparation is sort of um, unique in that, that it does touch on all those different groups, and so it really does require um, really intentional collaboration um, and, and 
um, conversation to make sure that everyone's working together. And, and people have similar questions. It's really inefficient if everyone's in their own world doing their own data work. And that if, if, if we do have those conversations and do work, work more closely together, I think we get better data and we have a more efficient and valuable process. Um, so thinking a little bit more about a more effective process, if, if you can think of your dream scenario, what what does effective data sharing look like? And in that dream scenario, if it doesn't currently exist, um, what does that allow you to do better in your work? Um, and Anthony, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, so we're fortunate in the state of North Carolina um, where the EPPs here um, have a governing body, the UNC General Administration and the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction great collaborative working relationship between those two entities and we actually have a UNC educator quality dashboard I don't know if we can do a screen share at this point but I wanted to kind of you know glance at that if possible for just a moment sure Jen is our tech guru is taking care of that all right can you all see the screen that yep. I'm sharing Great. So this is the home page of our UNC Educator Quality Dashboard. And as you can see here, um, this dashboard uh, really allows us in a very interactive, transparent way to show exactly what the EPPs in the state of North Carolina are doing across four indicators, recruitment and selection, educator preparation, performance and employment, and university school partnerships. So I, I'm just going to click on one of these here so you can see it. I've already preloaded it for you. But this is uh, the selection and uh, entry requirements for the EPPs, the public EPPs in the state of North Carolina. So you're able to see what every institution requires for admission into its teacher education program. So here you're able to see GPA requirements and those types of things. But this type of dashboard is uh, fantastic in the sense that it allows for that transparency that uh, Nicole talked about earlier. It allows individuals to really see what the EPPs are doing and how our candidates are doing as they're moving through our programs and then what the candidates look like once they become alum in the schools in the state of North Carolina. Now I want to emphasize that in the state of North Carolina point because once a candidate leaves as an alum and goes to another state, we no longer have access to that individual's performance data necessarily. So as long as the individual is staying within state, we're able to track and monitor performance along these types of indicators. So we've got a good system here in the state of North Carolina. Some of the challenges that kind of come along with this level of transparency though, and I've been a, a victim, if you will, of this transparency, is you begin to have these conversations with lawmakers, chancellors, provosts, uh, members of your board of trustees, even parents of prospective candidates who are now using these data to make comparisons between institutions. And if they're not well versed in data literacy, if they're not well versed in what this information means, so in other words, if they're not a, a, a truly knowledgeable consumer of the data, then these data can be used in an adverse or perhaps punitive way. Mm -hmm. So the good thing is it opens the door for conversation so you could be, begin to help people understand concepts like triangulation and reliability and validity and the need for a common indicator system and those types of things. But if those individuals aren't engaging knowledgeable people about these types of concepts in conversation, then they may come to negative value judgments about institutions. So it's a great thing to have this level of transparency, but now you have to ask the question, what about the knowledge level of the consumer when it comes to data literacy? Yeah, I think you raise a really, really important point, and I think that's a question that comes up when we talk about transparency in, in any topic, really. And um, uh, we do here at DQC, we do a lot of work on school report cards, and that is a question that comes up a lot is you have a variety of people accessing that information, and how do you make sure that it's consumed responsibly? Um, and I think there are opportunities that the state has when, when putting out these resources to provide that context to make sure that the um, introductions and the explanations of the data points are really easy to read and understand, and, that, and there are some resources that have a context button that you can click, and, and it will sort of explain the extra information 
and you need to know in order to really understand what is this data point telling me and maybe more importantly what is it not telling me because exactly. I, I think you, you raise a really really um, important point. Thanks. All right, so um, to add to the idea a little bit, um, in terms of my our dream scenario, in terms of what type of data that um, we need access to, um, I think that here um, in this, we're a small school and a small state, and we have access to a lot of great data about how candidates are doing when they're in our program. Um, and then once they leave us, we um, get data about um, principal satisfaction in their first year. We, we track them to find out where they go for their first year. Um, and we can look at our, our candidate satisfaction or our completer satisfaction to find out you know, do they feel prepared after their first year? But after that, we really lose track of them. And so um, we, we really need more access to find out where do our, um, where do our candidates end up. Um, in terms of effectiveness, how are they um, performing in the classroom and how are their students doing? Um, are, and when I say that, I, I do agree that we need to be careful with value added. Um, or our summative type te test data, um, are they um, getting growth out of their students is really what we're most interested in. Are, we, are they seeing progress in their students? Um, the other question that I feel like um, is important to ask is, um, and get an answer to, is how do they compare when we're looking at a more experienced teacher? Are they um, performing at a similar level or is there a gap in practice between that first year teacher and a, a teacher that's been around for a while and then as an educator preparation program how can we close that gap and and I don't know that we have access to that type of data where we're at um, so that would be really valuable for us as an educator preparation program yeah absolutely closing the loop on you know what happens once your students leave leave your program it's really important mm -hmm. So um, in Massachusetts, we've been talking to our EPPs a lot over the past year to talk about what, what is a dream scenario and how can we work together to realize that dream scenario. Um, so right now we're taking a lot of what we learned over the past year um, and are applying it to the, sort of the next iteration of our data platform. Um, and we're also doing a few things to address the timeliness issue around our data, which is which is often a, a big um, criticism or critique um, of the data system. Because a lot of the data is tied to workforce outcomes, and that usually doesn't come um, back to ed prep programs doorsteps until it's been the candidate has been employed for a year, the data has been collected, the data has been cleaned and shared back. So um, in our next phase of work, we're definitely trying to increase the, the level of accessibility of our data reports while really honing in on key questions that our EPPs identified for us as things that, they, that are really high leverage for them. Um, the other big thing that we heard was this notion of taking some of the burden of doing the heavy lifting analysis off of our EPP. So we're trying to do some of that heavier analytic lifting for them or instrument develop development for them as well. Um, a very real challenge in all of this work is the timeliness of outcomes data um, because I mentioned it, it is tied to workforce and, and that's a very real reality for us. Data cleanliness is, is definitely another real struggle that we grapple with. Um, but I would like to note two new data metrics that are, well relatively new, that our EPPs have access to that kind of jump over that barrier of timeliness. Um, so the first is our stakeholder surveys. So we issue surveys every year um, to key stakeholders to assess their perceptions of readiness. Because it's data that, that we sort of own and that isn't necessarily tied to whether or not a candidate gets employed in a, in a public school, we can turn that data around pretty quickly um, and give it back to our EPPs within six months of collecting it. Um, another key data point is our um, candidate assessment for performance, so a performance assessment that our candidates complete during their practicum. Um, and this is what we call an, sort of an in-program measure, meaning that um, it's the EPPs that are collecting and certifying the data. Um, and the nice thing about that is they have access to that aggregate data in real time, and as soon as they certify that data and send it to us, um, it's back on their doorstep in a form of a nice dashboard report um, before that cohort of candidates finishes their first year of teaching. So they can really use it as a, as a formative tool um, to help make program improvements. 
Um, Anthony, you brought up a really interesting point about transparency and sort of the pros and cons of that. And so I just want to say a little bit about how Massachusetts built political will um, to do this work. So the first thing was, you know, and, and here's a real theme of transparency for you, you know, back in 2012 when we created our regulations, we were really, really upfront with what data points we were going to be collecting and sharing and how we'd be sharing them. And I think folks really appreciated that. Um, we, um, our data platform that I keep talking about um, is privately available to our EdPrep program, so the public doesn't have access to it because it contains a lot of data um, and you need a little bit of know-how and a little bit of context to interpret that. Um, we do publicly report some data, but the reports are a little bit more streamlined um, and where applicable, we've um, given our EPPs the opportunity to include a little bit of context on that data page. So if they know something about their preparation program that's yielding that data, that's certainly something that they can include there. Um, in our accountability system, um, we've been very uh, uh, purposeful in not creating sort of benchmarks or cut scores um, around our data. We really um, do triangulation, we train our reviewers to look at multiple data points all couched together um, in making their decisions. So those are just a few ways that, that we've thought about sort of building political will around um, data use and I think that our providers, I know that our providers are really appreciative of that. Yeah, and I, I mean, a, a theme throughout a lot of your comments is just it seems like there is a, there's a pretty consistent dialogue that you all are having with your ed prep programs um, and I think that that is really important and valuable and um, fundamental to, to any sort of continuous improvement right it's not something that you do one time in you know once every three years it's it is an ongoing process and so you do have to have that dialogue in order to be able to understand how how things are landing with people is it meeting their needs um, and and are you all as a state getting what you need from from programs so I think that's really important um, and Nicole we'll stick with you for this next question but we've we've talked a lot about sort of the the data that that is most useful, what does that sharing look like? Um, but once the data gets to the programs themselves, right, they, they need the capacity and they have to have the capacity to use it um, and to use it meaningfully um, with, with their staff and, and professors and students. So um, what are the capacity internal and internal structures needed at the EPP level to leverage that data to really drive improvement and um, how, how do you think states can support that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in Massachusetts, we have seen a huge range of data literacy among our providers in our state. Um, our organizations want the data, but don't always, it doesn't always translate into knowing exactly what to do with it or how to interpret it when they have it. And so in our first two years of our data platform being out there in the world, we collected um, usage data and we found that less than half of our EPPs were even accessing those reports. Um, and so that was a really telling data point for us and we realized that we needed to take some steps as a state to, to build data literacy among our providers. So um, two concrete examples of things that, that we're doing um, and I think this will also illuminate some of the skills that and competencies associated with doing this work. Um, so the first is setting the expectation that, that EPPs will use data for continuous improvement. So in our state approval process, it's a large part of, of the review is looking at um, not only what are the decisions that you're making as a result of interpreting the data, but also um, are, you, are you using data and are you using data to, to, to tell your data story? Uh, so that was the first step. The second thing is really making sure that um, folks to know what they're looking at when they see the data. So who does this include? Um, what, it, what? Tell me a little bit about this data point. So in sort of the second iteration of our data platform, we've really worked to build in some accessibility features. For example, some hover overs um, in the data system to say, you know, this is the definition of what this data point is. And, and here's a little bit of, of background information that, that might help you to understand what this data is signaling to you. Um, a third thing that we are doing, and this will be the first time that we're doing this now that um, all of our data that we outlined in our 2012 regulations has actually come to fruition, is um, providing some really targeted assistance to our EPPs who are about two to three years away from going through their state approval process. So um, early next year we'll be hosting um, a data institute um, and we'll get folks in the room, we'll have conversations with them about what is high quality evidence, 
How do I think about using evidence both from the state but also evidence that, that the EPP is collecting themselves? Um, how to use all that data, put it all in a pot and, and pull out something that, that signals something about their performance um, and getting feedback from their peers as to the, the quality of that. So definitely something we're excited about um, and, and definitely something to stay tuned. Great, thank you. Anthony, can you talk a little bit about your work at ANT and how you all are, what sort of capacity building you do in your program? Sure, uh, I ditto a lot of what Nicole said. Um, this process of continuous improvement, it's really, really challenging work and it's extremely time consuming and it requires a lot in terms of infrastructure. So uh, when you begin to look at how our system and how our program is structured, we have to ask the question, you know, do we have the appropriate personnel in place and do we have the resources to bring on board the appropriate personnel so that we can do this type of data collection, data analysis, data implication. So I've been fortunate at North Carolina A&T where I was able to have a full-time position so we could hire a data analyst who has really helped us in terms of mining our data and assisting us with the continuous improvement efforts as well as the dissemination of those data and the integration of those data into advertising and marketing material and sharing uh, with uh, prospective candidates and their parents and so on and so forth. So fortunate to have such a position, but quite honestly, I need a team of individuals who would work alongside that data analyst. So the other piece to this is uh, building the data literacy skills of the administrators in the College of Education and the faculty. Um, it's one thing to look at curriculum alignment and those types of pieces, but then you have to go to a granular level and ask the instructor, what does this mean for the class that you're teaching and how do you close the gap based on the data analysis that we've performed? So the question that we're always emphasizing, uh, how do we use the information to close that gap or how do we use the data to sustain and elevate what we're doing? Um, so it's an intentional process to ensure that we have agenda items that are always focusing on a slice of data so that we're always digging deep in terms of a collective conversation. But then we have to look at resources that are available to ensure that our faculty and administrators are uh, going to conferences or work sessions where they're developing their uh, data literacy skills. So I've uh, been very fortunate to be able to send faculty members to AACTE pre-conference workshops. Um, Deans for Impact has been fantastic in terms of the Impact Academy and things that they're doing to help build capacity in terms of a team of individuals, just not the dean, but the associate dean, the assistant dean, faculty, and so on and so forth. So those are the types of capacity pieces that we're always having to visit and revisit. The other piece that we're trying to do a better job at North Carolina A&T is working much more closely with our P12 public school partners and sharing our data with our clinical educators and our school principals and having them share data back with us so that we're mutually aware of the shared successes and challenges as it relates to our data. Uh, that way we can be assured that we're reading from the same hymnal, uh, reading from the same page in the hymnal, and we're singing in the same key. So, you know, it's conversation up and down the line and then trying to allocate resources to meet the priorities that we need to close the gaps to improve. Yeah, so I, I think you bring up a lot of important points here. It's not just about you have to build the time to actually use and look at the data together as a team, but then you also have to take the time and invest the resources to make sure that your team has the skills and that you have a deep bench of people with those skills, that it can't just be the one person who knows how to look at data and slice and dice it and have a data conversation, but that it needs to be um, collective ca capacity building within the entire program. Absolutely. So Katie, you're at a smaller program. What are the considerations um, when it comes to continuous improvement for, for smaller APPs out there? Yeah, so um, we are a really small program. And you know, Dr. Uh, Graham said something that really stood out to me about the personnel and resources that you need to be able to really take the data and use it to, to close the gap. Um, 
and I, I think it's important to consider what those that personnel is. Um, you know, in a small institution, we do not have a data analysis. We do have an assessment coordinator that collects our data, um, but then from there, it's really up to the faculty and the administration to look closely at that data. Um, and so, finding the time to do that um, in a way that is meaningful is is a challenge, um, especially when you have a very heavy teaching load. Um, and, and then to add on to that, Nicole talked about how in Massachusetts they worked really hard um, to take that data um, and do some of the heavy, heavy lifting for the EPP programs and make sure that that data was in a nice package for that EPP program so that the data was more accessible to EPP programs. Um, and I think that's key for smaller programs as well who don't necessarily have access to all of the resources as larger institutions. Yeah. Um, and then finally, you know, and, and Dr. Graham touched upon this as well, but as, um, as instructors and faculty in an EPP program, uh, training is key to figure out how to take that data and look at it and really understand how we can manipulate our curriculum and our field experiences for our students to ensure that they're ready to go when they walk into the door of their first classroom. Wonderful. Well, thank you to all three of you um, for your great, great conversation. We have, we have nine minutes left and we have lots of questions. We had one final question that I do want to get to, but I'm going to challenge our panelists to keep it tweet length. Keep your responses really, really short, um, although this is a super open-ended question. So this will be a challenge, but um, this last question is, you know, where does the state's responsibility for this work end and the EPP leader responsibility begin? What does that sort of balance of power look like? So in 140 characters or less, how do you answer that question? <laughs> Um, <laughs> can't do it in 140 or less, but okay. what I'll say, a little bit of leeway. Um, I, I believe the state should establish those global parameters that Nicole talked about earlier in terms of the expected outcomes and then work collaboratively with EPPs to provide the support mechanisms to produce data that aligns with those expected outcomes. I love what I hear Nicole saying in Massachusetts and the supports that are provided there for EPPs and I think that's the type of model that we should be emphasizing and stressing. I do believe though the EPP should have that autonomy to really build their curricula and their programs in a manner that responds to the needs in the context of the specific institution that it's trying to address. So as an HBCU, there's a certain population that I know our candidates will be going uh, into and we want to make sure that we're preparing them for those contexts. So, um, but I will say this and then I'll shut up. I do think <laughs> EPPs have to do a better job working with one another to identify and articulate common indicators that are valid and reliable across campuses and then we can use, or excuse me, we can collect that data on a larger scale so we can begin to analyze the impact of what those data mean to the profession at large. So right now I think we do a lot of great things individually, but I do believe we need to start working together more collaboratively and asking ourselves the question, what instruments can we use across EPP so that we can collect data in a much larger, grander fashion and then really analyze what those data tell us so we can try to elevate the profession. Wonderful. We'll give you the new 240 character Twitter for that response. That was more like 540. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole or Katie, do you have anything quick to add to that? Yeah, I would say um, for us in our state, we are descriptive of expectations, but not prescriptive of approach. We'll give you the data, we'll make it available, we'll provide you with resources, but it's up to our providers to decide um, how to interpret and how to use that data. Did I do it? Yeah, you did it. I, oh, yeah, no, my, my rough count. <laughs> Katie, any final thoughts before we jump into questions? So I guess my, my, tweet, my Twitter response would be, you know, the data, first of all, we need access to the data, and that's important on the state side, and having a goal set for us would be wonderful. Um, I think um, EPPs, it's our responsibility to really take ownership of that data and figure out what it means so that we can make sure that we're producing high quality candidates. Um, so I guess that is where I see educator preparation's role. We need to take ownership of our data to make sure we're doing what we are saying that we're doing. Wonderful. Well, I just a huge thank you to all three of you for for making the time to be here today and having such a such a 
really rich and interesting, um, diverse conversation about this. And we have about a thousand questions from um, from the audience. Um, so we, we probably won't get to everything, but we will show everyone's contact information. So please feel free to reach out to the panelists if, if your question doesn't get asked. Um, so um, for, for everyone or anyone on the panel, what kinds of partnerships have you seen between EPPs and the state or local departments of eds that have been um, positive? I'd just like to highlight some work that we're doing in Massachusetts. This isn't indicative of a specific partnership between a particular EPP and a particular um, school district, uh, which, I, which I, th I think is how I'm interpreting your question. Mm -hmm. uh, but some work that we're doing is, is we are fostering a sense of calibration uh, among um, what do we consider to be proficient practice in our state, right? So we're getting EPPs and their partner districts in the same room. They're watching data. Uh, data. They're watching data. They're watching a video together of a, of a teacher. Um, they're simulating this is an unannounced observation. Um, I should back up a step. In Massachusetts, our educator evaluation framework is very much aligned to our new candidate assessment for performance. Um, so the, the um, rubric is very similar. The elements are very similar. The process is very similar. Um, so they're watching this video together. They're, they're rating. Um, the quality of the of the, the lesson, um, they're picking a particular element, and then they everyone submits their their rating. The data pops up on the screen, and then we have a really really great conversation about, whoa, everyone's skewed this way, or, or we're everywhere. We're super. There's so much variation here. What's going on? What? It's just a really interesting data point to think about how well calibrated, how reliable are we um, across our state. Anthony, this next question is for you. Um, they'd like to know if you feel like the, the dashboard that you have access to is a model that should be considered for repl replication across the country. I would say yes, um, but I would add the caveat, and Nicole mentioned this earlier, um, once you open up everything, you now have no control of the consumer's knowledge, so how might they be interpreting the information? So. Um, maybe thinking through the dashboard in terms of what you want made public and what you don't want made public. Um, but absolutely, I think that the dashboard is a fantastic uh, approach so that people know exactly um, what's happening at the institutions. And it really holds us accountable. I can't tell you how many meetings I have where I just pull up the dashboard and put it in front of the faculty and administrators and we talk about what we see there. And it, it ensures that there's a great level of communication and collaboration between the EPPs and Department of Public Instruction and General Administration. So it forces us to get on the same page in terms of conversation and communication. Great. Um, Katie, this question is for you. Um, what specific things helped you when, in your first year of teaching, um, sort of get through that first year? And um, I'm going to add on and say, is there anything that you feel like the, your prep program could have done to support you in that first year? So, you know, we had a mentoring program at my school that actually lasted for three years. So I was assigned to a high quality mentor um, and that really helped me. I also landed in a school where collaboration was really highly valued in the science department. I taught middle school science reading and social studies, but in the science department collaboration was really highly valued. So I really depended upon um, my peers at school um, to help me get through. Um, and I also started my master's degree fairly early on. and so. Um, that PD um, that was really driven towards what I needed help on in my practice was useful. Um, in terms of my prep program, I think I needed more experience in a middle school, in a larger school, and, and I didn't have access to that. Um, that being said, on the flip side, from a small um, prep program, I know that that is a challenge. Um, you know, we are located in a small area and it's hard to get our students into more um, diverse large schools because we're surrounded by small um, rural schools. So I know we're almost at time, but I'm going to end on this last question, which is which is to everyone on the panel. Um, what kinds of data tools are most helpful for you and your team to make data actionable and accessible? And if you don't have that tool, um, what's something you, you'd like to see developed? I think for us in Massachusetts, the most helpful feature of our data platform is just the ability to customize 
and see the data in a way that we want to see it. So if we want to see uh, a particular year or a particular program, um, a particular uh, subgroup of students, uh, we can do that. So we can really hone in on the questions that, that are both important to us at the state, but also to our, our EPPs as well. Yeah, I'm going to look very narrowly at our clinical practice component. Um, we have an instrument that was developed by McCrail that we're using statewide and um, it aligns well with the teacher effectiveness evaluation for our K-12 teachers. So that instrument really orients our candidates while they're in our program to how they're going to be evaluated once they become classroom teachers employed by the state of North Carolina. So that's one of those tools that I think is a good one that we're using in the state and positions our candidates nicely for the evaluation instrument that they'll see once they're employed within a K-12 school. Great. Just to add for my ideal tool that, that we don't have access to, um, the ability to track a student from the start of their preparation throughout their career. Nicole talked about in Massachusetts assigning the student that, that number and then you, that number following that student through their career. And I think that's a really powerful tool that I would love to see an example of um, so that, that we could maybe try to model what we do after that. Wonderful. Well, I just want to, again, give a huge thank you to Katie, Nicole, and Anthony for joining us today and for everyone, all of our attendees, for, for taking an hour of your busy day to um, have this great conversation. And I'm sorry we could not get to all of your questions, but we've put up the contact information here, so please feel free to reach out. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, we'll be sending around um, a link to the web, to a, a recording of the webinar if you want to share with, you know, friends and family, anyone you think would be interested in this. So thanks, everybody, and have uh, a great rest of your day. Mm-hmm. <laughs>